Hello everybody and welcome back to LMM. And if you're enjoying what you're seeing on the channel at the moment, links to our social media is coming up on the screen now, including things like our Patreon, where you can get exclusive content and help the channel to grow. Today, we're here next to the main road at Fimber Holt, home of the Yorkshire Wolds Railway. And today, we're going to be reviewing their main locomotive. But first, a word about the sponsor for this video, and this one is one that I am very excited about because it's KR Models, a 00 gauge ready to run manufacturer, the creators of the award winning GT3 model. And it is my pleasure to be able to tell you of some of the other models that they have available for pre-order, including the Southern Leader Class, a locomotive I never thought I'd see in a ready-to-run form, and I am very, very excited for it. It's available from £185 and available in five different liveries, three of which are entirely fictional. But looking at the pre-production samples, it looks like it's going to be a magnificent model, of which I'm going to have to give myself one. Also available for pre-order are these power brick wagons available for the first time in double O gauge and costing just £60 for a rake of three and I think you'll agree they do look rather marvellous. And also available for pre-order is this something genuinely exciting, the Southern Railways 4DD, a double decker train, yes we did get it in the UK with prices starting from £375, certainly something to watch out for. If you want more information on their fantastic KR models, check out their website which is in the video description. And with that, play the theme tune. Now you may have to excuse the sound of traffic going on in the background. So the running line here runs directly next door to the road. And there is literally nowhere I can go on the site where I can be away from the traffic. So bear with me. But behind me, we have number 5576 of 1979. And let's just marvel at what an attractive little diesel shunter it is. It has all the things that I really like on a diesel shunter to make it particularly attractive. It's got coupling rods, it's a four coupled locomotive. And of course, it has wash stripes. These are all the very important ingredients that go together to make the ideal diesel shunter. Don't worry about anything else or power, how it is to drive or anything, no. Coupling rods, wash stripes, jobs are good. And it's brilliant. I also like the fact that it's got the kind of centrally mounted cab, well, central-ish, you've got the back bonnet and a front bonnet. It just makes the thing have a bit more character and a bit more of an interesting shape to it. It also immediately, just sitting there, has this amazing sense of purpose, doesn't it? Sits there and it goes, I am a diesel shunter and I will move the entire world for you. And I like things where you can just walk up to it. You don't even need to hear it run or see it do anything. You just go, yeah, that's powerful. That's gonna move stuff. And it's just got that amazing sense of, kind of, it just draws your attention to it. You go, yep, that's gonna do a good job there. Now, the history of this one is an interesting one in that we don't actually know quite a large chunk of it. What we do know is the name on the front, that's a lie. Despite the fact it proudly wears the name of English Electric, it was actually built by the subsequent company. So already we started off with something that's not quite right. It was built and delivered for Shotton Steelworks in North Wales. And it was there for some amount of time. We know it was there. But beyond that, it all starts to get a little bit vague. There are rumours that this went and worked on the Channel Tunnel at some point. But what we do know is that some point after the kind of after the 80s, that this ended up being at RHS services, being at the internal shunter, moving wagons and things around before a period of time. It was then it changed ownership. And this time it fell into the more unusual owners have been owned by Railtrack, who are the people who came before Network Rail, and Trackwork. And they had a combined project with Lindholm Prison. The idea being that the people inside could learn valuable skills that when they were released back into the open world, they'd be able to have engineering skills and possibly look at getting jobs. This was a project that could help change lives. And what were they doing? Well, they were taking this apart and then putting it back together again and then taking it apart and putting it back together again. This was a job and a project of heavy engineering. 
and the principle of this sounds really good, teaching people skills. Unfortunately, the project lasted for a period of years and then it wasn't renewed. So the prison ended up with six panels of track and a locomotive which had never run on said panels of track. And at that point, people started to find out about a locomotive that was in theoretically complete and working order and some track. Say, a small railway that's just started up who's looking for some track and a locomotive. Communications were opened. And this was something that took several years, I kid you not, actual years to arrange this thing and the track. And the deal that they ended up doing was, well, not what you'd expect. The prison basically decided that they wanted to sell the track at the price that it costs for new track because these panels had never been used. This isn't second-hand track that's been used before. This is stuff that has come out of the factory and is ready for the main line. That means it's quite expensive, but to sweeten the deal, if the society bought the panels of track, they'd throw in one locomotive. And that sounds quite a good deal. Buy the track, you get the locomotive to run on the track for free. And so they did. And in 2013, this arrived here, where it's been ever since. And it was basically a matter of turn it on and see what happens. There was one slight problem. The locomotive is fitted with a sensor to detect that it is stationary before it changes gear for going from forward to backwards. This little sensor wasn't actually fitted, so the locomotive would quite happily trundle that way, and then it would stop, and then it would continue to want to go that way, which if you have a railway that isn't a massive circle, that's actually a rather important component to be missing. That was rectified, the locomotive would engage reverse, and from that it's had some other minor works. Both of the coupling rods have come off and they've been remachined, so they are now an absolutely perfect fit. It's had new brakes fitted, so it actually stops. And finally, the air system's been taken off and recertified. And it's had a, a new coat of paint. The most notable thing it's had in its history, though, was it's been renamed. Originally, the locomotive was known as Eddie. And in some circles, it still is. But in honour of the landlord who's allowed the railway to be here and allowed it to grow, the locomotive was named in his honour and the man himself came down to rename it. And the story goes that he didn't know that the locomotive was being named in his honour. So there was a genuine bit of surprise and pride as he pulled back the curtain and went, it's named after me. And I think that's a really nice touch. It makes it a lot more personal to it being here on this site. And yeah, it does help to keep the landlord on side. There are a couple of features that I particularly like about this thing. One of which are the lifting eyes on it. Now, I know that lots of locomotives have them, but they just make it look more chunky and it gives you an idea that this is very much designed to be moved around, that you could pick it up and move it. And that's mad all, you know, pick it up, lift it off its wheels, but it's just the engineering size of that and the size of the world, that's, that's really quite proper. And as we're at the front of the engine, get a chance to look at this, yes, it's got an air pipe. It's an air brake locomotive, but it has the ability to run air brake stock. And that's slightly more unusual on a locomotive that was just built for industry. I suppose working for the steel mill makes sense that it was fitted with brakes to actually control the stock there. What's more interesting though, is the fact that it's fitted here with a standard plug-in type connector for air tools, you know, like we use around a workshop. We think that this was added when it was at the prison so that the prisoners could fire this up get the air tanks charged up and then use air tools, which is a rather genius addition because you know, you've got air tanks, therefore you can use air tools. You've got a compressor, air tools. And the reason it's still on it is the guys here have actually used it to maintain it. When they were flashing it back to repaint it, air tools. When they were redoing the bodywork, air tools, all running off the locomotive. So the locomotive itself is actually helping to power its own restoration. And that's kind of nice in a, a roundabout kind of way. The other thing I really like about it, and the thing that's been changed, is just up there, you've got the new lights. Now, they're those swanky LED looking lights, and they're not what it was fitted with. It had a kind of more Morris Minor style of lights originally. The problem is, though, that for trundling up and down here, keeping low revs and not working the engine hard, it was found that the old star lights, like the big headlight on the front, were actually discharging the battery more than they were topping it up with the literal trundle up and down. So to overcome this, 
the more energy efficient running lights have been added onto it, which I think is absolutely magnificent. And they don't actually look out of place because it's a more modern design of locomotive. They kind of blend in quite well and work with it. So that's the other thing with this. Being a locomotive that was built so late, the design harks back to a much earlier look. This is something I thought was going to be early 60s, late 50s, not be the very end of the 70s, almost the 80s. It's very much an old thing that survived into modern day, if that makes sense. It looks like an old design. It's a very traditional diesel shunter, but by the time we hit the 80s, we were starting to move more into the purpose-built machines and losing kind of this era of design. And I do love it. Particularly, I like the cutouts down here. So when you're climbing up onto it, you can just step up onto it and then walk up the steps. There's no climbing up ladders and awkward things. It's just quite pleasant. Step there, step there. It's very nicely designed. But on the subject of the steps, it definitely during its life has been mistreated somewhat because at the bottom, just round over there, you'll see that it's definitely hit something or something's hit it or there's been something left there because they are quite definitely bent under impact. And the reason it's carrying the Molten Dodger headboard? Well, that was the name given to the local service that used to work on this line. So with that, let's go and have a look at the power plant of this thing. There are lots of ways of getting into engine bays and lots of different designs of panels that come off, doors that open and get in your ways. And this is one of my favorites for getting past that problem because it just does that. It concertinas, lovely, out of the way, doesn't block access, it doesn't come off in your hands and threaten to overbalance you on the side of the running board, it just gets out of the way. That is absolutely brilliant and I like it. Inside we have a Gardner 6LXB engine. This is a six cylinder diesel with about 11 litres displacement which generates a mighty 165 horsepower and that goes through a twin disc hydraulic drive which uses the diesel from the fuel tank as the hydraulic fluid. That then goes through the same final drive system as an 03 or an 04, which was, I believe, manufactured by Leyland, or part of Leyland, or part of Leyland's empire anyway. And that then gives us drive down to the wheels. The gearbox at the end is quite clever because it's an automatic changing. So your hydraulic drive goes into it, then the rear end final drive decides what gear it actually wants. You as the driver don't have to do that. It makes it all up for you. All of this comes together to give this a tractive effort of 16,120 whatever it is we actually measure tractive effort in. And that translates into layman's terms as being able to quite happily move at least 200 tonnes, which is a sizable enough train. It's quite a, a meaty little thing because it weighs 28 tonnes. Well, that's quite a lot for this because it doesn't look like a 28 tonne machine. It's quite small and squat. So it's obviously made of quite thick steel to give it that kind of weight, but it does mean that all of that pushing down on just four wheels means that it's going to be able to put down a lot of that power before it loses traction. So with the engine looked at, let's move and have a look at the controls inside the cab. That's brilliant. As we've walked around the engine, you may have noticed that it's got one of these a little buttons on all four corners. And that, of course, is an emergency stop. It is a piece of plant after all. So if you hit that, the engine shuts down. And that has led to a little fault. One of the switches had a bit of water in it, and so it would continuously short itself out. And the crew here just had a locomotive that would be fine, and then for no reason at all, would just shut off. Press the start button, it would restart and carry on. And they were sat there going, what is wrong with this? Have we got ourselves a totally dud locomotive? Why, why does it just stop for no reason? Yeah. Eventually somebody suggested, maybe it's one of them that's mucking up and sure enough, full of water, drained it out, it's been fine ever since. But I don't remember seeing another locomotive that's got the stop buttons. Because it means that it could be trundling past and you could just be like, <laughs> dunk, and just cause chaos. Anyway, to the cab. The first thing we notice having got into the cab is that we've got away from the road noise. It's once again quiet in here and with all of this sound padding up in the top, it's a very pleasant cab to be in. It's very nice and airy. There's room, there's plenty of glass everywhere. There's opening side windows here on the other side and most importantly the doors over here they open up as well giving a whole amount of fresh air coming in and out. 
And I like that, that's an important thing. Also, what's very important is there's a seat here with a backrest which moves over to become your armrest if you're going out of the cab. And I like that. It's a sprung seat which is on top of the batteries, but it's just nice and pleasant. It's a much more pleasant thing to be in. The fact that it's all painted bright in here, it's very, very nice. I like this design of cab. There is a bar over here that when you've got to stand over the transmission here, you've got a bar for stability. The only thing I don't like is when I'm stood here, I've got the whistle cord just hanging around. I keep touching it with my hat. Looking in front of us, we have the control desk and the main controls are mirrored. We have our throttle here, we have the gears for forward, which is that way, and reverse here. In order to select one of these, we need to pull the throttle back into the clutch mode, like that. So it's a combined throttle and clutch, which is very clever. And then we have the brake over here. Sanding levers are just tucked over there as well, and again, on each side. Then we have this little lot of stuff in the middle. So working from the top, this is the train brake gauge, so if we've got a train, that tells us how much air we're actually putting down to the train. We have our main brake cylinders here for how much we put on with the loco and how much is in the tank. We have the battery charge gauge to let us know if it's discharging or charging. And we have the torque converter temperature here, and below it, we have the pressure. We have engine coolant temperature here and engine oil pressure. And then we've got one of these weird speedos that works in both directions for letting us know how fast we're going that way or that way never understood why it has to go both ways just have one that goes tells you how far like a car that works rather than that way and that's just weird and then of course engine revs are there we've got a useful panel across here that lets us know if the clutch is disengaged or if you're in forward or reverse useful things so you can just immediately know which way it's meant to be going and then tucked over here we've got a battery gauge that tells us what the voltage is and then we've got an engine counter that's been mounted on the side and then we have the cool things we have a warning light here for low oil pressure, the master switch here, a start button, the stop button, a battery discharge light, which is currently illuminated because we've got it turned on, and then a whole host of buttons. We've got a cab heater, which works. We've got windscreen wipers here, 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 and here, which all work. We have an inspection socket, which doesn't because it's not there anymore. So that was for a hand torch. You could turn that on, it would put power so you could inspect things around the loco, but that's not there anymore. The roof and side flashes. Well, this used to have a yellow flashing light and that's something I despise on locomotives. I understand why you've got to have it, but I hate it on a locomotive. Yellow flashing lights are stupid. You can hear it coming. You're not gonna notice a yellow flashing light on a locomotive, you just, you, you just won't. So that's not there anymore. Reverse headlight, that works. The mark light, they work. The interior light, that works. The panel light, that illuminates the panels. Forward headlight, that's work. And the step lights, it never had those fit in the first place. So that's a, a very strange thing. It's got a thing that it was never actually fitted with. But that's it. It's so unusual to come across an industrial locomotive that has everything working on here, minus two things that were taken off. It's not they don't work, they've just been removed. It's a really nice seating position. Got good visibility that way, good visibility that way. It's just very pleasant. And the fact it's dual controlled, it's designed to be driven by one person either side so you can see what's going on. You can drive this side and get good visibility there, or you can drive over there. Very much designed for one person and very, very well laid out. I like this a lot. And then coming over here, we have the handbrake slap bang in the middle of the cab, easily accessible from both sides. Going down there, we have a trio of taps. You see, the bonnet over here is actually the diesel tank. There's a filler cap either side, and this whole area is diesel. So we have taps to shut off the diesel feed, taps to turn off the transmission feed, so we stop sending diesel to the torque converter, and finally, a drain for if we want to drain it. It is very important to make sure that you don't open the drain when you mean to open the one that puts the fuel to the engine, because it won't send fuel to the engine, it just puts it on the floor, and that is bad. So with the general controls looked at in here, let's go do the prep, which I expect to be absolutely minimal because it's a modern locomotive, and then we can fire it up and go for a ride. Rolling ourselves back in time to this morning when we got here to start prepping the locomotive and parked ourselves right next door to the road behind the camera. My cameraman is almost sitting on the road, so do excuse the noise. Starting off around here, we have a grease point just there, but rather conveniently, they've already done that for me. So all I have to do is take this unscrew the cap here and now just fill that up like so 
whoops, and just like that. Brilliant, put that back and move across here. Again, there are three grease points, one just in there, one there and there, but they've done them for me as well. And then I have to do this oil point here as well. It's worth noting that this didn't originally have oil pots on top, they were grease as well, but it was found when they took the rods off that the grease just wasn't doing enough work. It was insufficient and it was scoring the rods. So they've put oil pots on, which you can just top up as the day goes on. With that done, and totally not over oiled at all, just uh, give that a quick wipe, lovely. We then have the front brake hanger with another three grease points on it, all of which I don't have to touch. So I need to do that on the other side, but I'm not gonna show you that because it's exactly the same. And then we can get up there and stop the prep inside the engine bay. Now, one thing I do like in here is it's very spacious and particularly the air tanks are stored front just up there. That's a very clever and novel place to hide them out of the way. So what do we have to do here? Well, reach across here, pull out the dipstick and see if we have any of the good old liquid dinosaur on it. And that we do. So we can replace that back into the dipstick. All done, with that being good. Next on the water pump there, there's a grease point, but they've already done that. And then on the torque converter just down there, there are two grease points, one this side and one the other. I'm beginning to think that they don't trust me to have the grease gun because they've done all the greasing up for me is over there, but they've done that. Next thing to do is we need to hop up there and see if there's any water in it. And that of course means clambering right inside here to get to the radiator. Unscrew the top there and I need to clamber right in to have a look. Now, I'm never going to get a camera in there so you can see, but I've just realized that the front of this opens up. So that's probably a much easier way than trying to do this to go. But yes, there is indeed water in there. And with that, it's onto the cab. And now we're back in the cab to do the last bits of prep. Down here, you have the oil box gear stick hidden under here. There's also this little oiler here that I need to put some three in one in, but that is full. And that is for the stop germ detection. So it knows that you are not moving for it changes again. And here we have the dipstick. That is a long dipstick. <laughs> That's a silly long dipstick. Uh, on the end of that, we can see that there is indeed some oil, so that is fine. Put it back in, that's fine, so that's ready. Oh, coincidentally, under here, we have the top of the final drive, and we've got this little control here. We can lift that up, twist it, and push it down if we need to push the locomotive. So if it's died and we need to disconnect the drive, that's how we do that. And with that, we're ready to begin the starting procedure. Here we are on board and off for our trundle along the line. And the first thing I take from this is just how amazingly quiet it is on board the cab. I've driven a wide variety of diesel shunters now, and this is superb. There's so much padding in here that you can hear the engine, but it's like a distant noise. It's like the engine's at the other end. It's absolutely super. And then of course, I've got a nice seat, which is cushioned and then magnificent visibility forward and backwards. Down there, I can see down to the buffers and down there behind me or in front of me because we're going backwards at the moment. I can see down to the buffers, which is super because it means for actually shunting what this was designed for. You can see what you're doing clearly and easily. There's no kind of the front end somewhere vaguely over there. It's a very easy and precision art. And then we come on to just the controls, which are a joy. So the throttle is sprung, so if you let go, it slows itself down. But it's amazingly responsive. There is a slight delay as it thinks about what it wants to do, but as soon as the revs pick up, it just launches off. It's absolutely superb. Everything's mirrored as well, so you can drive them either side, which is fantastic. And then 
The brakes are magnificent as well as we come up here to the end of the demonstration lot. Just drop the throttle with that very pleasant sound. Drop that away and just gently feed the brake in. I think it's so controllable. It's absolutely perfect. There's a, a little marker here. And I can just very easily just go whoop, and bring it to a super control stop. It's absolutely magnificent in that regard. And then going back this way, again, brilliant visibility this way. The throttle is wonderful. It's just, as diesel shunters go, this is certainly one of the best diesel shunters I've ever had to go on. Just because of the condition that everything works as it should, everything is easily within reach. The ergonomics of this are very good. And then of course it does just, it sounds great. So my only gripe with it really is that they've got no stop currently for me to pull. There's nothing to really test out what this thing can do. So because it gives such an immense sense of power and that grunt, it just screams out. He wants to train, he wants to take something and really test out what it is. And I can't do it. And that's really upsetting. So I want to see what he do. I want to see what it will pull. And I want to move something with it. I want to work a heavy train with this. I think it would be a doddle. I think you get some good noise, but it would just walk away because it has this amazing just sense of power and purpose. And as well as that, it's just rather aesthetically pleasing. It's just a nice thing to look out on. You go, yes, this is a functional, but very pretty locomotive. Coming again from that day when things were properly designed, somebody actually thought some put some real thought into this. Again, just beautiful control roll into a hole so good it's genuinely so very good and as well for a small four coupled locomotive it rides here beautifully well now it could be that the track they've laid here is of wonderful quality but it just glides along and you would expect on a little 040 for it to bounce and kick a bit and I know I'm sat basically in the middle but it's just great every time you get onto an 040 you expect some kind of bucking some kind of kicking this thing's just like no nope, no problem at all glide along it's absolutely magnificently brilliant There's also this decent design cab, there's light, it's airy, there's room to move, you don't feel claustrophobic in it. It's kind of rare in a regard that to drive a locomotive, that you sit there and go, actually you know what, I could do this day in, day out. There's a leg room, it's comfortable, I can brace myself on the back of the cab here to feel like I'm not sat on the edge of something about to fall over. It's just comfortable and well thought out. And I know it's a later locomotive, yes, I know it's something that's been designed from the time where it should be good. Yes, it should be well thought out, but it's so rewarding and so just pleasant to have something that is well thought out, that goes as you expect it to, that it's comfortable, that you could use it. This was designed to be used, and it's absolutely brilliant. Now, of course, the most important question of all is, would I have one? Oh yes, without a shadow of a beat. This is perfect. It's about the right size that you could just about look after on your own. But you will go anywhere and do basically anything you want, but within limits of a small line. But it's powerful enough to move basically anything. It's easy and simple to drive. It's just a really, really good example of a diesel shunter that's 
well, perfect for what they want here. And not just perfect for what they're doing now, but it's perfect for what they're going to do, what they hope to do in the future. It will run whatever service they plan, it will do the distance, and it won't complain. And the people will be able to drive it day in, day out, and they won't complain. It's just, it's perfect for what they want to do, and what they will do, and what they're continuing to do. And it's rare to come across a locomotive that's so just, yeah, this is perfect. It's absolutely perfect. I can't think of anything else which actually would be any more ideal. For giving cab rides, it's a big cab, there's plenty of room in it. It's easy to drive, it's pleasant. It doesn't make too much noise. It will move any train that they get, so if they get carriages, when the brake van comes into service, it will move it with no problem. It's just absolutely perfect. So that brings us to the end of the video looking at this, well, rather nice little diesel shunter here at the Yorkshire Wolds Railway, which I bet until now you didn't even know existed. Now, if any of you happen to know anything about this locomotive and you can fill in any of the blanks of its history or perhaps you've got some photos of it in part of its earlier life, the railway would absolutely love to hear from you. And if you quite like the railway as well and you want more information on when they're open or stuff that's going on here, the link to their website is in the video description. As with all of the projects they've got going on where you can help donate and support them. And of course, if you'd like to be part of a new heritage line with a future and help make it happen, then they would be absolutely delighted to hear from you guys. So information on the website, have a look, maybe come along here and help build the railway. Now that, thanks for watching. Hope you've enjoyed it guys. And of course, we we'll hope to see you next time. If you have enjoyed this one, how about clicking somewhere over there for another one of Lorry Goes Loco or down there for another diesel Lorry Goes Loco we've done. Ta-ra!